also uh, to uh, divulge their history and their interests for our edification. And we're also going to sing uh, hymns which have not been chosen by me but by you, the public. And um, there we are. And we're going to start with um, two that have been chosen. One, um, I can't recognize the writing, so I can't as ascribe uh, all the uh, um, uh, writing. But anyhow, uh, the first one is um, Greatest Thy Faithfulness, which is 186, uh, followed by 235, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. So we have one traditional and one slightly more modern one. So 186 followed by 235. Had converted before. 
However, when he landed on the south coast in Wessex, he found the, the, the West Saxons to be so pagan that he decided to stay among them. This was in 635. For all this fascinating information, I am indebted to Beryl Waters and her Oxford Book of Saints. She does give a rattling good sermon, and uh, you sometimes learn something. Pyrrhus converted to Christianity the Wessex king, Sinindus, and his family. Then the king's daughter was able to marry the Christian king of Northumbria, Oswald. The grateful King Finiglis appointed Birinus as the first bishop of Dorchester. And he began to found several churches in Wessex. But he later moved into the Thames Valley, into what was to become our own diocese of Oxford. Many churches were founded here. None of the surviving churches, however, can be positively identified with Birinus, with this period, except one in Wing in North Buckinghamshire, which is quite near where the great train robbery took place. However, we may speculate that Birinus inspired the foundation of our own St Andrews about this time albeit it would only have been a wooden structure with a thatched roof. There are no illustrations of the church 900 years ago, and the earliest map even um, is, is quite late, 1604. King Henry I was on the throne of England in 1112, and he was a Norman. It was only 46 years after the Norman Conquest and only 26 years after the Doomsday Survey was compiled. In this Norman inventory of our village, the population is indicated as about 40. This does not include those unable to work. So it does not include the very old, the very young, some women, and possibly a few Norman invaders. We were all under Norman occupation. So perhaps in total, there were about 80 to 100 people living here, including Robert Gurnan, our Norman overlord, his family and household. These church rector appointments were usually of a political nature. They too were Norman occupiers and were often powerful men with great influence and close to the king. For the next 200 years, Raysbury's rectors would have Norman French names. The invasion and the occupation by the Norman hordes had brought with it severe hardship and persecution all over Britain to the Saxon people. The Normans took their land and farms, also their livestock and crops. They took away the means of supporting themselves. They had become slaves and were sometimes reduced to eating grass. The year 1112 we are celebrating was not a happy time for the people of Raysbury. The Abbot of Gloucester was probably not in residence here very often. He delegated his church duties to a minor priest or a friar. A bit like Simon, really. <laughs> the administration of the church in the village was to become more than just about things spiritual. The church was to become the only source of local government for the next 800 years, when the vestry administration of St Andrew's Parish was taken over by the parish council as late as 1894. The church was to become, in the 19th century, responsible for all the local services, 
They were responsible for law and order. They appointed a parish constable and his deputies. A surveyor managed roads, flooding, and we had a village gravel pit. They were responsible for the poor, a workhouse, and poor law relief. Tithes or money in lieu of tithes was collected to pay for these services and occasionally there was a poll tax in time of war to support the military. St Andrew's Church and the village of Raisbury, although relatively small, were in, in an important location politically. The whole of this area had become royal hunting grounds. So purchase, poachers should be aware, beware of punishment by the king. Historically, we were two miles from Staines, or Ad Pontes, as the Romans had called it. For them, it became an important military town and a fortress on a Thames River crossing. Old Windsor was the site of the royal palace and the court of the Saxon king. Only two years before the appointment of our first rector, Henry I had moved from Old Windsor to a very new Windsor Castle. The parish of Raisbury and Anchorwick were later to become administered as a royal manor and given to successive queens of England in Dower at their wedding. In the future, several of St Andrew's rectors were to be men of influence, friends and advisors to the king of the day. 1112 was also during the period of the Crusades. Christian kings and armies fought the infidels who occupied Jerusalem and the Holy Land. In 1100, Jerusalem had been retaken by the Crusaders. From this distance in time, it may be that all these events from St Andrew's early history may seem remote and of no possible relevance today. Don't large numbers phase you. You need not take them in. Numbers so large you can't really take them in. The astronomical number of light years between stars and planets. The millions of euros that are won on the European lottery. Even the 2,000 years since Christ's birth. So what about 900 years since the abbot was appointed? Or maybe 1,300 years since the conversion of the Saxons in Raisbury? From this distance in time, these events may seem, as I said, remote and of no possible relevance today. However, think. Maybe some comfort may be found in the evidence of a continuous line of faith and Christian worship here in this place. For as per perhaps as long as 1300 years. A prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this holy place, this church of St Andrew, the clergy that guide us, the congregations that gather here, the visitors who come to inquire and admire. May they always be here in your sight, Lord, Praise thee to worship thee, to give thanks to thee for the many gifts and benefits we all share. Amen. Amen. And with such gusto in 2015 that uh, any um, vicar still extant of the past. We're still around. <laughs> still around.
Um, we're invited to, uh, to the celebration down at the Clara, I think, are we not? Down at Anchorwick, will he be down there? He will. So 2050, put it in your diaries now, and uh, we will look forward to it. Um, right, thank you, Margaret, for that. Fascinating. So I've learned I'm a minor priest, and if I read the psalm, I could come up with that for three years of training. How wonderful that is. <laughs> now we're going to have hymns in reverse this time. We're going to sit down to sing Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, number 328, 328. And then we will stand to sing Love Divine to the tune Blind Burn. So. Number. It's 328 first, followed by 321. Okay. So very close. Tip for one, and stand for the other. Eleanor of Aquitaine, 
who actually owns more territory than the King of France. Also, bear in mind, all these kings, they don't speak English. They speak Norman French. If they're educated, they speak Latin. But certainly, English isn't on the agenda. Actually, the first king who really adopts English is Henry V. And we're looking some time to the future. Um, Henry II, um, he's an able ruler. He's got a massive empire to control. He's like a whirlwind, because you never quite knew where he's going to turn up, constantly traveling. Um, he tries to control the church, which at that stage had a separate government. And if you could claim to be literate and read a certain psalm, you could claim to be a priest, and that <laughs> preserved you from the full force of the law, and certainly you couldn't be hung. And this is what the argument about, is about with Beckett, because Henry II thought, oh good, I've got this very able chancellor and administrator, he will do what I want. And immediately Beckett's appointed, he goes in the opposite direction. And that leads to his death in Canterbury Cathedral. Henry II succeeded by Richard I, not a very nice individual, greatly admired in the Middle Ages for his prowess. He goes off on crusade, and England saw him for under nine months of his reign. Um, he's... Um, takes a lot of money out of this country because, first of all, to pay for his crusade, and then he get, makes the mistake of ending up in the territory of the Austrian Duke, who he'd upset during the crusade, and we had to pay £66,000 in ransom. Now, that sounds quite a, a moderate... Well, it sounds quite a lot today, but at the time, it's the equivalent of millions. And his successors are left paying it off for some time to come. He's married Berengaria of Navarre. She never came here. She's never crowned Queen of England. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Henry I, we don't know what his tomb is. And while they're digging, uh, busy digging up Leicester, they might try Reading, because he's buried in Reading Abbey, and probably he may well be under a car park. <laughs> so there's the prospect waiting for an archaeologist. That's the truth, by the way. Um, Richard dies, and he has two heirs. The heir of his brother, Arthur, his brother was the Duke of Brittany, who was about 12 years old. And by the way, children as kings in the Middle Ages was very bad news, because you needed to lead your soldiers into battle. And his brother, John, who's thoroughly undesirable. Um, I don't know whether you know 1066 and all that. It says, John, an awful king. When John came to the throne, he lost his temper and flung himself on the floor, foaming at the mouth and biting the rushes. Actually, that's wrong. That's his father. <laughs> he was thus a bad king. Indeed, he had begun badly as a bad prince, having attempted to answer the Irish question by pulling the beards of the ancient Irish chiefs, which was a bad thing, and the wrong answer. He did do that in Ireland went round pulling their beards and they were extremely offended, not unnaturally. Um, John is accepted by England. Actually, how Arthur died, nobody knows, and, but certainly John is implicated in his murder. Um, he can shake hands with Richard III, perhaps, in that respect. And actually, it's held against him at the time. 
And Shakespeare, who never mentions Magna Carta, talks about the murder of Arthur. Uh, John, though, secures England, but he loses wars on the continent. He's not actually a bad general, but he doesn't measure up in the medieval mind uh, compared to Richard, because A, he's literate, and that was almost a sign of contempt that you could read and write, and he has what we would consider irregular baths, but he has baths, and that's even a worse cause of conflict. <laughs> um, and he loses Normandy in 124. And that's a problem because the barons had land in both Normandy and this country. And they had to choose. What they often did was whichever was the bigger holding, the eldest son took that and the youngest son takes the other land. The problem is he's now in England all the time. Uh, which means he's a much greater presence and can enforce his rule on the barons. And from Henry the I, Henry the II, they are great lawgivers. They've started the system of justices going around the country enforcing the law. And not everybody appreciates that because the usual penalty unless it was a capital offence, was fines. And that's how the kings actually raised a lot of their money. Also, they sold wardships. King John treated women very badly because he saw rich widows as a good source of income, marrying them off to various uh, people who paid for the privilege, including his first wife, who was the Countess of Gloucester. He married again um, Isabella of Angoulême, actually seizing her. She was already engaged and in medieval terms might have been considered married to somebody else. But he takes her and actually from that marriage um, descends Henry III. And then he's got a problem with the church. That's, again, a theme through medieval history. He decides, because again, the church was wealthy, and while there wasn't a bishop or archbishop, um, the king could take the money. And the archbishopric of Canterbury falls vacant. And John decides he wants one of his candidates, the monks of Canterbury decide somebody else. And so they, um, the Pope decides, let's go for a compromise candidate and chooses somebody who'd not been in this country very much, Stephen Langton, who's a very respected academic. Um, John refuses to accept him. So a papal interdict is declared, which means the church is effectively closed, except for burials. Marriages in those days, the um, state part was done at the church door, and then there was a mass. During the interdict, that doesn't happen. But, and um, there's a threat to excommunicate John himself. Um, but he reaches accommodation with the church because having all the barony and the church against you was probably not the best idea, particularly in the Middle Ages. And John reaches an agreement with the Pope and after Magna Carta is sealed, and by the way, Magna Carta, if you look at its content, each of the medieval kings took a coronation oath. And if you look at Henry I, Henry II, guaranteeing freedom of the church, granting certain major cities freedoms, and um, issues over wardship, and how the barons were treated, 
because nobody would have been more surprised than the barons, the guarantors of Magna Carta, to think that we now own that charter because it was intended for their um, rights, certainly not that of the common people, because you've heard from Dennis that very few of them had <coughs> rights in the Middle Ages. And then it's King John's, in King John's time that Magna Carta is sealed because he's up against the wall. In fact, a few months later, the barons call in King Louis um, of France to invade this country. And actually, he established a very considerable foothold in the country, except Dover Castle held out. And actually, King John did a favour to everybody because he died in 1216, actually of overeating, which was um, actually probably symptomatic of his lifestyle. And his young son, actually he's crowned with his mother's bracelet because the crown was too heavy um, in Gloucester Cathedral. And King John, who always claimed that he was a direct descendant of Edward the Confessor, not true in physical terms, but again, these charters that come through when... Um, the coronation charters of the various kings, they look back to this glorious time of Edward the Confessor. Whether it was that glorious, and sometimes I think the Anglo-Saxon period is seen as a bit better than was probably the truth. I've told you a lot more about King John because, as you know, we are coming up to 800 years of the celebration of Magna Carta. I was looking on the internet and actually the Supreme Court of the United States has mentioned it 10 times in um, submissions over the last five years. So they own it, Australia own it, we're not let going to be behind that because we're going to celebrate in, with gusto in 2015. Thank you. And with such gusto in 2015 that uh, any um, vicar still extant in the past, if we're still around, <laughs> still around um, we're invited to, uh, to the celebration down at the Priory, I think, are we not? Down at Anchorwick, will he be down there? He will. So 2050, put in your diaries now, and uh, we will look forward to it. Um, right, thank you, Margaret, for that. Fascinating. So I've learned I'm a minor priest, and if I read the psalm, I'd have come up with that for three years of training. How wonderful. <laughs>
by thy gate, but to defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For thou art thy only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love from this night forward and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.